All right, what's going on, everyone? Welcome back into another episode of the Behind the Mic podcast. I am Mike Cadlick, joined for episode two by none other than NBC Sports Boston's Tom E. Curran. Tom, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, first and foremost, how are you doing today? Great. Tremendous. Thanks for having me, buddy. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. This is uh this is awesome. A one of the uh one of the top of the line, top tier Patriots insiders currently um in and around the team. So I appreciate you joining me. Sure. Um before before we get into the nitty gritty of everything and sort of um, you know, your uh I guess more questions about um what you like, what you don't like, things like that. Just want to start off off the top. Uh we're calling it resume time, segment one. So basically the floor is yours. Tell us how you got to where you're at now. Um at NBC Sports Boston. So like, what was your journey like, um, what you did and kind of how you got to uh, where you are today? It was unconventional. And it's one that I think okay. when I talk to kids who are like, how do I get into the business? It's difficult to explain because the ladder that I climbed up is burned. That bridge is gone. So okay. I was an English major at St. Anselm College. Was always a, a really good writer. That was what I was good at. I was a good writer. And, but I didn't do anything in college in terms of advancing my journalistic career. Back then you go to school when you're a little younger and when you're out of school, then you start worrying about what you're going to do after. Now kids worry about it in middle school. Mm -hmm. It's different. But by the time I did get to my senior year, I interned briefly at WMUR for a guy named Frank Malicote. And I did that on my own, just went and sought it out. But I still didn't have any journalism experience. Came out of St. A's. Worked spraying lawns down the Cape. Then I sold security systems for a year. Then I didn't do so well at that. So I went back to spraying lawns. And at that juncture, I'm like, shit, I'm pushing 24. I still haven't gotten into what I would like to do, which is writing. And at that time, when I was spraying lawns, which is basically down the Cape for a company called The Lawn Company, Mm -hmm. I was in my truck all day listening to WEEI when it had just begun. You know, the fabulous sports babe was on 10 to 2. Dale and Eddie were on and I listened to it all day and I would formulate columns, stories, angles. And I'm like, I really have to do this because I know that this is what I'm good at. I know that I'm a good communicator. Quit the lawn company in December of 92 and then started sending out resumes. Now, I didn't know if I get a journalism job. I was trying, but I was also trying PR, media relations, anything I could find. Went for an interview with CVS as a manager. But I finally got a job at the Barnstable Patriot, which was a 1,300 circulation weekly on the Cape. I had to deliver my own newspapers. Chris Price actually worked there after me. Wow. But I worked there from uh, February of 92 till June of 94 and got a job in New Hampshire at the Claremont Eagle Times. Had just gotten married. My wife and I moved up to Claremont, New Hampshire. And because she was a teacher, she took leave. She was the one that made the money. <clears throat> so we stayed there for 14 months. She's like, I, I can't take two years off. I got to go back. She went back. I went back. At that point, we were living in Quincy, and I was stringing for the Attleboro Sun Chronicle, the Patriot Ledger, um, spraying oyster bags for my brother-in-law down the Cape. Um, and I finally got a job at the Waltham News Tribune, which was a five-day-a-week paper. And um, how old were you at this point? Now I was, in 1995, 28. Okay. Still making horrible money. Okay. Um, probably making around 22, 23, 28 years old. And while there, in 1996, we had our first son, Sam. And I'm really not doing great <laughs> because it's a very competitive market. I was trying sure. very hard to crack it. But one of the bigger breaks I got was in early 1997, the individual who was at the Metro West Daily News, Middlesex News at the time, decided he didn't want to do the job covering the Patriots anymore. So an opening was available to go to the Middlesex News. And I knew that that was the one job I needed to have. I had covered the Patriots or followed the Patriots since 1976, grew up reading Ron Hobson, all I wanted to do was cover the Patriots. I wanted to actually work for either Sports Illustrated or the Globe, but my goal was to be covering the Patriots. So I committed to my boss, Mark Murphy. I would do anything 
to do that job. I'll do it brilliantly. I'll continue covering all the high schools in the same way. So that's what I did in 1997. Um, first thing I covered was the draft with Chris Canty drafted in 97. Yep. And Pete Carroll's first year. And in getting there, I realized at that point I'm 29 years old and I'm behind everybody on the beat. And in order for me to sustain, now we had um, two subs. Okay. In order for me to Yeah, make life comes meet, at you quick then, huh? Yeah, they did. They came three in 34 months. <laughs> so in, in order for me to, to succeed and do this for a living, I had to do a, a really good job of it. And I really honestly looked at the crew that was covering the Patriots. And they did it in a very conventional way, which was go to the press conference, listen to what the coach says. Everybody writes the same story. Go into the locker room, talk to the same players. Everybody writes the same notebook. So it was generally just paint by numbers. Sure. So I worked very hard during Pete Carroll's time to try, try and come up with as many novel angles to things as I could. And I felt that I was pretty observant. And over the course of time, I, I think that the team realized that as well. And Pete Carroll did. And you know, I forged relationships with players that to this day are outstanding, like Ty Law. Um, Ted Johnson, those are guys who I, you know, got along very well with, William Malloy. So it was a really cool indoctrination because it was a very tumultuous time in the Patriots history. And I was a fresh set of eyes on it with the exuberance and, and enthusiasm that might not have matched or might have exceeded some of the folks who had seen quite a bit. Sure. At the Road, the Herald and the Journal. So I was there until 2002 into the bridge through Bill Belichick, and into the Brady Bledsoe situation of which, you know, I, I had a report in early 2001. No, excuse me, late 2000. Okay. That um, the Patriots were not enamored necessarily. Robert Kraft had serious doubts about Drew Bledsoe as the future of the franchise. And was very well vetted, very well reported, very well sourced. And the Patriots took such offense to this that Robert Kraft called the Globe, the Herald, the Journal, and the Associated Press into his office to debunk the story. And then Jonathan Kraft went on WEEI and said, look, I don't know who Tom Curran is, but I'm telling you, I'm not going to the Metro West Daily News for my Patriots coverage. Right. So this is the stuff that sticks. And you yeah. have guys like Dale but Arnold. Did, I feel like, did you... Now, did you just talk about this recently on a podcast or was it in the Dynasty? No, I, I never feel really like I went just... into... I, I, feel like I, I don't know. I, I, story, I hope I'm not being redundant, Mike. No, 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 no. I want to hear it again. This is why we're here. This is no, I don't think it's the same story. story but okay, it's okay, not the okay. same story because the okay. next story is, so they resigned him to a $100 million contract, but in the course of doing that, there were folks within the team, very high up within the team, mm -hmm. who told me going into the 2001 season, you're right, because I used to call <laughs> okay. Bledsoe a hood, or, hood ornament. Like, yeah. He's kind of a hood ornament. He, we need him, but there are limitations. And we saw that play out in 2001. And as that season wore along, having watched closely the way younger folks will do, you sit under the tent with me and uh, watch me relative to you or Taylor Kyles right. watching <clears throat> training camp practices. I'm not charting reps anymore. <laughs> right. I just, but, you know, I'm catching enough of it to formulate an opinion. Right. But, the intensity that you're watching. And I'm like, I'd go to people I'm like Bledsoe kind of sucks. Brady's faster than him. He's more accurate than him. What am I missing here? And that played out. So that really in 2001 into 2002, <clears throat> my profile rose along with the profile yeah, of the team. Mm -hmm. And being someone who was willing to say that Drew Bledsoe is never going to get his job back the day he got hurt. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, certainly was something that, People took note of. Interesting. 2002, I got a job at the Providence Journal. First, some person who had been hired outside the building since 1986 because it was everything was union. Mm -hmm. So they hired me to do the job. I worked there from 02 to 06. Had great relationships with Bill at the time, Brady at the time. It was obviously was a, a high time in the franchise's arc. And then I went to NBC Sports in 2006, when they got Sunday Night Football, they launched a website, which they actually hadn't had previously. NBC Sports had no website. So they launched it with the intention of just doing 
Olympics, Notre Dame, and NFL. So I was their NFL writer. A couple years later, I was the only one left of the three that they hired, and they farmed us out to Mike Florio and said, how about this? We're going to have Florio do the NFL, and you can write for Florio. So I'm like, oh, shit, this isn't going good. I'm, I'm not going to be flying around the country. I'm going to be on my couch aggregating. Right. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, at that time in 2009, November, um, CSN, Comcast Sportsnet, reached out to me and said, look, we're going to build out our regional sports network and do this in very much an ESPN type way. Every single day, we'll have six o'clock and 10 o'clock sports center type shows called Sportsnet Central. You guys will be writing, reporting, guests on our shows. And so from November 2009 until now, I've been there, which is extremely lucky. And I've been extremely yeah. lucky the whole way through to be covering the team I've been covering. It's, uh, it is a fascinating story. And it's uh, interesting to note, too, like you said, the unconventionalness of it, because sort of the reason why I wanted to launch this pod, but also the reason I want to have these conversations is, I mean, I'm sort of just getting my feet wet in the industry, but I think a lot of people are interested too in how each of us and everyone sort of finds their way because there's not really a cookie cutter way anymore. Like it doesn't just happen where, like you said, journalism school, this, that, and the other thing, like Mm -hmm. there's ebbs and flows, there's ups and downs. So uh, that's, that's definitely, uh, that's fascinating the way, the way it's happened for you. So um, I have a question about breaking news for you because Mm -hmm. um, clearly you have connections, uh, you know, in the building, you talked about how, um, you know, who you've grown to know and things like that over the course of the last 20, 25 years. Um, and obviously one specific one really this year was the Gerard Mayo thing, or not the really the Gerard Mayo thing, but the Bill Belichick where Bill Belichick, it's likely that he's gone. And that got a lot of run that got a lot of waves. Um, but it wasn't necessarily conventional breaking news either. It was sort of, um, you said it on TV, people took it. We talked about aggregators, people aggregate it. And then, um, but it wasn't necessarily like a, you know, bang per sources. I'm mm-hmm. tweeting this type thing. It was sort of snuck under the rug, if you will. And so I'm curious your approach, uh, to breaking news with the connections you have, um, how you take it. Um, then yeah, just sort of your approach and your thought on how you do it compared to some other people. Yeah. It depends on what the story is. Okay. I mean, if it's a broken ankle mm-hmm. and someone within the medical staff tells me, I'm just going to say, according to sources, sure. You know, Christian Barmo broke his ankle. Mm-hmm. If it is something that is an inclination, if it's something that is projecting the direction of something, sure. if it's from a source who is a great, would be extremely compromised, mm-hmm. then I'm just going to characterize it. You know where I learned all this from? Bill. Interesting. I'll tell you a story. In 2003, there was a player that the Patriots were intending to move on from. And I said, really, why? He said, watch this play. So I watched the play. And it came clear as to what was a limitation. Mm -hmm. So I later on said the Patriots feel as if this player is not playing at this level anymore. And that caused a real poop storm with that player and his camp. And Bill later said to me, can't you just act like you're smart? Can't you just act like you found it yourself? Yeah. What is this? The Patriot stuff. I don't need that out there. Just pretend you're smart. Okay. Yeah. So in that period of time, when I was at the journal, and this is something another guy named Len Pascarelli, who was at ESPN, told me, said there's a there's a level of reporting that you could do, which is called voice of God. Mm-hmm. And I kind of got acquainted and reliant on that reporting. Mm-hmm. Because if you look over the course of time, when I report things with no qualifiers it's because i know yeah yeah yeah. and but if i say team source if i Mm -hmm. say ownership source if i say league source then it starts a feeding frenzy within the organization to find out where's the source who's the source who said this what can we infer if i'm just saying something 
then it protects my sources and quells the interest within the organization to smoke it out. Sure. Okay. So whether it be that player in 2003, whether it be uh, the disposition of Tom Brady, whether mm -hmm. it be how the Patriots feel about player X, Y, or Z, or whether it be talking about the likelihood of Bill Belichick returning. Mm -hmm. If I speak of this is how I believe things are headed, I think over the course of time, people have become acquainted with the fact that I'm attuned enough to, well, he talks to people, he gets it right. Right. Now, there's, there's a uh, absolutely, look, is that Washington Post, Columbia, Columbia School of Journalism way of doing it? No, but I'm not also... You know, we're not covering the Pentagon here. Right. Yeah. No, that's Although, okay. despite the fact that there's an interest in it. There, there is no massive public interest threat or otherwise sure. behind these. So while there is a level of, hey, shouldn't you double source that? I think there's insinuations that go on in reporting all the time at all levels, whether it's politics, um, sports, culture, mm -hmm. and you're not gonna to be told things that are for sourcing. You're gonna to be told things that are on background. You're gonna be told things that are um, off the record and there's two different things there. Yep. Um, and how do you use them? How do you pass it on? And why did I use the information that I got in the way that I did is interesting as well. Because I was never told when I spoke about Bill's situation, this is on the record or off the record. It was a presumption to me that this is off the record. Might be okay. on background, but this is off the record because a trusted source over the course of time. Yep. You understand what the rules of engagement are. So I'm sitting there week after week on television in conversations about well, what's Bill going to do to save his job? Mm -hmm. What's Bill going to do to save his job? Does this save Bill's job? I finally said, this is so disingenuous on my part to sit here and spitball about how Bill Bill's job's going to be saved. When I know that he's likely not coming back regardless of what happens, that ship has sailed. So that's why it went out in the fashion that it did. That's interesting. Yeah, okay. That's fascinating. And again, it's it it kind of leads into like my next question for you. Just I'm curious about your quick slant show um, and sort of how that came to be. But it's kind of your whole, and I keep using the word unconventional for a lack of a better term, but the way you get into the business, unconventional, the way you cover the team, um, and sort of how you got your rise a little bit more unconventional. Mm -hmm. Now this news breaking, it's unconventional. So is that where the idea for click slants came? And I know that's more of just a, you know, your TV show, um, yeah. on NBC sports Boston, but can you kind of take me through the the start of that and how it's evolved sure. over the course of the last 15 years? And one thing I'll say too, just relative to my reporting and writing, which I yeah. used to do much more of when I was more strictly writing and doing less TV. Mm -hmm. When I was at the Metro West daily news, I'd write five or six stories off a game. I'd write a 1A column, and at that time I said, okay, the 1A column, that's usually Bob Ryan or Dan Shaughnessy. I'll write in that fashion so it's easy for everyone to understand, especially a primetime game. I would write for an on football or Patriots beat, we called it. I would write that like Borges. I'd also write a game story, so I was writing that like Nick Cafardo. Then I'd write a notebook and a sidebar. So I was trying to be all these different individuals who were at the Globe. Mm -hmm. So that helped me when I got to the Journal – or to NBC Sports Boston, or was on the radio or um, on TV, mm -hmm. I found it very easy to morph. I can okay. be an analyst. Yeah. I can be a columnist. I can be a beat writer. I can be a feature writer. So those were all strengths. And that's why I end up wearing multiple hats, which means that upbringing or the way I came up yeah. makes it easy for me to go on quick slants and do a show that is goofy, Mm -hmm. ridiculous, has skits, right? but also has breaking news, hard information, and interviews in mm -hmm. which we're trying to, to cull things. And again, it, it's sports, not the Pentagon. So you can cull information that's relevant to the team and relevant to the fan base with a smile. right? And I think that, that that's an important thing about that show is those guys, whether it's Mayo, McCourty, McCourty, Van Noy, um, any of those guys who've been on with me, and there's more of them, have always been able to to shoot straight. Like I did a book with Edelman, and he was he told me all that I needed to know. So there's an element of trust, I think, in reporting. 
sure. the way we've done it and the way we do it, where the more established you are, the more able you are, unfortunately, to say, you know what? If I write this, I'm going to compromise this or lose this individual. So I'm not going to. But when you're coming up like you are, you need those splash things to make 100%. a name. So, you know, I can have 30,000 conversations with Tom Brady over the course of time and only really report right 15 of them. And otherwise just characterize his mindset in, sure. in ways over 20 years. Right. So, but people can look at the individual and say, oh, that guy knows what he's talking about. He's been there for a while. So it's hard. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned Mayo then on Quick Slants with you. Um, what was it like working with him on the media side? I think, and we know now he's been, you know, they've broken the, uh, so far tried to break the barrier with the media um, since mm -hmm. he took over. Um what was it like working with him? What do you make of him as the next head coach? This is more so a football question, but kind of uh, what yeah. it was like working with him on the media side too. It was a blast. I mean, he was uh, unbelievably personable, funny. Look, you get two guys who are very different, who are working together closely, which, you know, I, I don't think that whether in this day and age or any day and age, you got a, a black guy who played high level football at Tennessee, who is from Newport News, Virginia, dealing with a skinny white kid who went to a virtually completely white college, St. Anselm, and grew up in yeah. Pembroke, Massachusetts. What's the common ground? And the common ground was massive, actually. It was football. It was sense of humor. The things that we were amused by. It was busting each other's balls. And it was all based on trying to give information to people. Mm -hmm. So there was way more common ground than a jacked-up linebacker with cornrows and – a skinny pale reporter right. and we found that and we had a good time doing it the one thing i'll say about him is he used to get pissed every week because i would always either show up on time on the dot or two minutes mm -hmm. late and he was always there before me oh, yeah. and this was in 2010 2011 when we were starting out and he always would leave on tuesdays when we did the show from skipjacks because he would be going down to do game planning this is the second and third year in the league they would have him down for defensive game planning purposes. I don't think there's a lot of players who go to the game plan meetings, but he was doing right. that. But I had a blast with him. I mean, mm -hmm. then he went, went went to the podcast, and he's so exuberant in the things that he explains and how he explains them that I think he's a brilliant teacher. He's a great teacher. He's an enthusiastic teacher. How will he be as a coach? I think it's, it's hard to project because somebody's going to have to be the bad cop in there, and I'm sure he's yeah. aware of that. Mm -hmm. because he's been a player. You're going to ask people to show up on time. You're going to have to put out fires. You're going to have to discipline players. Um, people are going to betray your trust. Right. But he has been coaching for a while. And, you know, when people say, oh, he's only been a coach for five years. But he also was an all-pro linebacker. Right, yeah. I mean. They call them Gerard Belichick. Like, that's like a known yeah. thing. He was basically so he spent a lot of time in the league. Like, Even if you're not walking around with a whistle, does that mean your mind's a blank and you don't know what you're talking about? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Um, all right. Then earlier too, you mentioned, uh, and when you were talking about too, like wearing five hats on a writing side, mm -hmm. um, you used to do a lot of writing. Now you've turned into TV, obviously a Patriots talk podcast, um, taking those things into account, but just the whole, um, your entire job in general, what's your favorite part? Like what is a one number one, your favorite part of, uh, being in this position? Probably talking to Phil. <laughs> oh God. Okay. <laughs> Probably talking to Phil. I really right. enjoy working with Phil Perry. That's probably my favorite part of it because okay. we've been able to develop a friendship over mm -hmm. shit 13 years now. And he works so hard to get so much information and to get it in a certain way and frame it in a certain way. And, you know, there's times that he'll lean on me for assistance in it. And I know that my approach is different than his, but he has respect for the way I do it because mm -hmm. over the course of however long he's seen, oh, that's effective. He, he, he has a way of doing things. And these are the things I do like Tom. And these are the things that I want. Mm -hmm. So that's probably my favorite part of the job. My favorite part of the job too, is being done with a story. I friggin' yeah. can't stand writing. It's painful. Have it's you like, always not stood writing? Or no, did no, because okay. previously it was more, that was the job. Mm -hmm. So I understood that. But now there's so many different masters to serve 
the mm-hmm. TV, the morning email to deal with the TV show, yep. uh, the podcast, the getting of the guests for the podcast, the formulation of the podcast, the pumping out of the podcast, right. the quick slates. So when I sit down to write, I'm like, I've already talked about this. Yeah. I've already potted about this. I've already sent show emails on this. How do I put something new out there? And writing's hard, as you know, as anyone right. who's writes anything knows. I mean, I wrote a 1100 word story this morning and that went quick and it took three hours. Yeah. Sometimes when I'm doing, and I don't have, a, I don't write short, unfortunately. I need to write shorter. Well, well writing is, with writing, it's like you need to have stuff out in the news cycle whenever something happens, but you can be in in a good headspace to write and be able to do something super easy because you're just in the zone. And sometimes you're in a writer's block and it, it nothing comes to you and you still have to try and get something out. So like, that's the hard yeah. part. Yeah. I mean, the pl- number of places over the course of since doing this <clears throat> since 97, the number of places I've written with a laptop mm-hmm. on my lap, the number of occasions when I've had to write Steve McNair dying on July 3rd, <laughs> we were down the Cape. Mm-hmm. And we, I was coaching baseball and I was work, working for NBC sports.com. And I was like, I, I got to go. Now that's the weird thing is probably 1200 people across the country probably read the NBC sports.com column by Tom Curran on Steve McNair. That's why people are like, Oh, you want to go national? No, not really. No one cares what I have to say about the Cardinals. I'd rather stay here. Thanks. This is yeah, the right. best place to be. Interesting. So that's uh that's one of my other questions I want to get to in a second. But we talked about favorite part. You kind of mentioned writing. Is that your least favorite part? I know it's it's kind of, and I talked about this with Reese last week on here, where it's kind of silly to ask about a least favorite part because you know pe- a lot of people would love to be able to sit and talk about sports all day like we do, and obviously we're lucky for that. But what is your least favorite part? What is something that people might not know? Like ah, oh, that's kind of a pain in the ass. I don't really feel like doing that. Um, probably the writing. Okay. That and I unfortunately I've always kind of been an impatient prick and a know it all. Okay. So I think one of my least favorite parts is being able to accept graciously differing opinions on things, whether it be from coworkers, okay. uh-huh. fans family members mm-hmm. so i think one of the hardest things and things i don't like is, is sometimes the air of condescension that i can ooze when i disagree with something interesting okay and we spend a lot of time with myriad takes right on our shows mm-hmm. and some of them i think are just patently stupid to broach because they're either a never going to happen or b they're so far out there that they don't warrant the air that will be breathed into them by us conversing about them. But then we justify the takes and I will too, by writing them, Mm -hmm. by breathing the air into them to debunk them. Sure. And I think that that constant push pull between entertainment, information, analysis and opinion is constant. Like I can say, Hey, Drake May sucks. But that's not news. That's straight opinion. Uh Hey, Drake May sucks. He's 50% inside the pocket when pressured. That's analysis. Right. You know, and that's, we spend a lot of time on the people who have the conscious, they said in Lord of the Flies, Mm -hmm. with information free opinions. So that's yeah, no. Okay. That's actually, it's a good point too. Cause there's a lot of that. There's a lot of, you know, people bring in their takes and take quakes or whatever you want to call it. And you blast something out there, but if there's nothing to back it, that's kind of when people are going to jump down your throat. Yeah. Like Andy Hart, who does bring a lot of information mm-hmm. and he's probably, he and I are probably too similar in our condescending air. Um, <laughs> yeah. I know it all too. I know it all too well now. Over he's also another know it all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But he last week said his head would explode if the Patriots drafted J.J. McCarthy. It would be the worst thing they could do. He was going to vomit all over his shoes. And knowing Andy as I do, mm-hmm. that felt more like an opinion sexed up 
to sound like information because I know he's capable of information. Sure. And really all he was pointing to is, well, the reps. He doesn't have enough production because he didn't. Mm -hmm. And there's a point at which your information and your analysis, you have to yield to what you presume to be the expert if you're just doing information analysis. You can say, I don't think Elliot Wolf knows what the F he's doing, mm -hmm. or he doesn't know what the F he's doing. That can be an opinion and analysis. But if you want to defer and allow yourself to have value for your informational analysis, you have to say, well, well let's see if he gets it right and right. what why he gets it right or why he arrived at that decision. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that, it, that gets wearying for me mm -hmm. where everything is so supercharged yeah. all the time, mm -hmm. every day. Where's my ass up? Yeah. That's no, that's a good point. Um, all right. Before we get into our final segment of our five rapid fire questions uh, to close out this part, I'm curious. And you mentioned to um, covering Boston, not wanting to go national, but is there anything that you haven't accomplished yet in your career so far that you'd still like to, or is this sort of, um, is this it? Or, you know, not that it's a plateau or you're done, but like, what, yeah. is there anything more? Like, do you want anything more out of this now? No, I'm having a blast. Okay. It's been great. People are like, you got to write a book. I'm like, no, that to me yeah. looks like a 50 foot steak and cheese. Small steak and cheese looks good. Write a book about the Patriots dynasty. It's, it's, that's a 50 foot steak and cheese with extra cheese and onions. Doesn't yeah. look that appetizing to me. I'm right. good with the day to day coverage. I, I mean, I've written so much mm -hmm. over such a long period that I could happily come up with a compilation of things I wrote as they happened, but to look back and, and try and write it, I, I wouldn't be interested in that. And no, I mean, there really isn't anything I've been beyond all comprehension fortunate to cover this team at this time, coached by Bill Belichick, quarterback by Tom Brady, the players I've encountered, the way they ran the business, the way the crafts ran the business, the access I've gotten, Mm -hmm. To be able to stay around where I grew up, right? With my family, you know, it's I couldn't ask for absolutely anything more than I've gotten. Well, that's I mean, it's the story itself, like it's super cool. Like you said, Pembroke, St. Anselm, here, paper, sports, paid, and listening yeah. to them on EEI and kind of thinking of it, um, as a fan and then turning it into like that's I mean, that's my goal. That's a lot of people's goals. And so, you know, to see a play. Unbelievably lucky. Like, cool. Just unbelievably yeah. lucky. And that's the hard thing too, Mike. When you wake up, oh, I got to go do a podcast. Oh, I got to go call Merrill Hodge. I don't want to do it. This is what you wanted, Nick. Right. Right? This right. is exactly what you wanted. You it happens to me in this in this office. It happens to me with my fiance. I'm like, oh, I don't feel like doing this right now. She'll be like, you wanted this so bad. Like, what are you complaining about? And it's so true. Reese and I work together at Metro West. Um, and every time I took a shit ass try, you know, try meet from Franklin track and I'd have to write out 15, I just look at it and go, this is better than spray and lawns, beat spray and lawns, beat yeah. spray and lawns. So he'll still say that to me sometimes when I stop yeah. pitching, ah, I'll beat spray and lawns, TC. That's a good point. I'm going to use that now. I'll use, I'll use it on you this year when I see it. All right. Fair. All right. Uh, before we get you out of here. Fast five to finish a behind the mic special rapid fire, five questions for you. Uh, we'll start with number one. What is your favorite thing to do outside of sports? Uh, golf slash basketball answer. slash read. Okay. Oh, read. Interesting. So you can't stand writing, but you read everybody else's writing. That's correct. Got it. Okay. Those are the three uh, things I like most. Number two. What is the most memorable moment, most memorable moment you've had in your sports media career so far? Uh, moment, uh, I, I mean, the, the most chilling moment I had was sitting on the 17th green in 1999 when Justin Leonard made the putt. Michael Holly and I were sitting together. We were covering the Ryder Cup. Interesting. I was covering it for the Metro West Daily News, and he was mm -hmm. at the Globe. We were sitting next to each other. So that was the closest I've been to a memorable event, seismic yeah. event. And trying to process what happened because you don't have TV there. Ah. And then just the interactions, I think, you know, memorable moments of, of covering the people I did. So it's a wide range, a mosaic yeah. of moments 
being able to cover the greatest team in NFL history. All right. Number three, best advice you've received in this industry. This isn't very fast on my part. That's okay. That's okay. Take your time. Write the truth. Okay. That's simple. Yeah. Just tell the Maybe. truth. Yeah. Tell, the, tell the truth and be yourself. All right. And number five, final. What's your favorite pizza topping, Tommy Curran? Sausage and onions. Okay. Nice. That's enough. a double. That's a double. That's okay. That you can kind of right. you can. I honestly, I think Reese said Reese said mozzarella, and then he added tomato and basil to it. So favorite pizza <laughs> in general. It's a cheese pizza, Mike. Yeah, exactly. I know. I'm saying, hey, hey, it's uh, it's up for uh, it's up for debate what kind of pizzas you like. So uh, that'll do it for episode two of the Behind the Mic podcast. Tom E. Curran. Th- oh, you know what? Actually, final question. What's the E stand for? Everything. I like that. Okay. That's no, a good answer. Stands for Edward. Everybody's no, in Yeah, me too. Nice. That's my middle name as well. So, a lot of right. Edward's running around. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been awesome. This has been an honor. Appreciate right, you joining Thanks me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Uh, you can. Everyone can follow the Behind the Mic podcast at Behind Mic Pod. Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, everywhere you get your podcast. Appreciate all the support. So, Uh, Again, episode two with Tom E. Curran. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and we will talk to you next time.